Welcome to the future. I mean, welcome to the first event in the new year of 2023, a year that has been in our future for most of our lives so far. And here we are. My name is David Wood, and it's my privilege to chair London Futurists. Our topic today is the possible future of how we think about the controversial subject of consciousness. Consciousness has been debated since at least the dawn of history. What is the relationship between mind and body? Are our subjective inner experiences, our so-called qualia or raw feelings, simply the interactions of chemicals in our brains? Now in the 2020s, many philosophers and scientists continue to claim that there is a hard problem of consciousness, that consciousness cannot be fully understood with the reductive methods of neuroscience and psychology. Against this, as we'll hear today, approaches called eliminativism and illusionism claim that consciousness does not exist in the ways implied by everyday language. With the advent of AIs that are displaying more features of apparent sentience, there's a renewed public interest in these age-old debates. At what point will it become, quote, immoral to switch off and dismantle an AI that seems to be conscious? When might an AI decide, quote, of its own free volition to take actions in defiance of its innate programming? And given the long history of philosophers apparently talking past each other on questions of consciousness, what prospects are there for clear progress to be made? Our speaker is J.C. Rees Anthes, a PhD fellow from the University of Chicago. J.C. is a philosopher, sociologist, statistician, and all-round polymath, who is the author of the book the end of animal farming, and the co-founder of the Sentience Institute, whose website starts with the phrase, expanding humanity's moral circle. JC, welcome to London Futurists. The floor is yours. Thanks for having me, David. Um, and I really enjoyed being on the London Futurist podcast. It seems like you have a great community. I'll share my slides. And in general, this talk, while it is a bit of an introduction to the current discourse of consciousness research. It's doing so through a deep dive into my particular view and a paper that I published last year in an AI conference. So most of my research is more empirical. It's on uh, social science, for example. So how do people think about the consciousness of different entities? How do they morally consider and evaluate artificial minds or non-human animals. Uh, my book on the topic was on animals in particular, but all of that's undergirded by the philosophical questions of what does it mean for someone to have moral worth? What does it mean for someone to be conscious or sentient and so on and so forth? So I think it's a really important topic. Um, I will try to explain terms as I go, so it should be accessible to a general audience, but I don't want this to be just another of many introductions to consciousness studies as a whole. Uh, hopefully it serves as, as an example of how discourse is happening right now and where we can go from here. And I'll try to keep a bit of an eye on chat and stuff my, myself, but I'll mostly count on David to do that. Um, I think clarifying questions, I'd personally be happy to take them throughout and we can have a longer discussion at the end. Okay, so the view is consciousness semanticism. Um, it builds on a literature that goes all the way back to uh, early human thought about the mind, about consciousness. This includes some Greek philosophy, uh, Greco-Roman and, and the classics. A lot of people will say that they didn't talk much about consciousness, but there were a few who certainly touched on, I would say, convergent or even synonymous topics like Plotinus, talking about, um, for example, Platonic forms and how humans might access those. So posing some sort of dualism or even a hierarchy of uh, the world as it is, uh, something that we're able to think as humans, and then these inaccessible but you know directionally reachable Platonic forms. Of course, Descartes was a very famous proponent of dualism, the idea that there's a different substance, so something called substance, dual, uh, substance dualism, which is different than the physical uh, you know, dirt and bones and things that we're constructed of in the physical world. 
but really um, this topic surged in interest, at least uh, in philosophical structure in the 1990s, uh, when David Chalmers, uh, a New York University NYU philosopher, posed the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, Chalmers has a lot of great work. He has, for example, a new book now on Reality Plus, so on uh, virtual reality and simulations and things like that. But he's most known for sort of posing uh, why we're so confused, why it seems so hard to understand consciousness. So this hard problem this is kind of lifted from the 1995 paper facing up to the problem of consciousness, where consciousness does not seem directly susceptible to the standard methods of cognitive science, whereby a phenomenon is explained in terms of computational or neural mechanisms. So basically, in, in my opinion, this is pulling on the intuition that even if we had a really robust neuroscience, even if we could map every circuit in the brain, even if we had a computational understanding of artificial intelligence and how to build any particular uh, version of an AI that we wanted that can express, will seem to express feelings in certain ways, for example, all of that, you know, the most mature uh, technological galaxy spanning civilization you could think of, how would they actually bridge that to what it is like to be me? So appealing to this idea of consciousness as something like what it is like to be uh, you, that was um, most famously posed by um, Thomas Nagel in What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Thinking about echolocation and the more subjective nature. Uh, it's been terms like qualia or phenomenology that people might be familiar with. It's something on the other side of an impassable gap where we just can't reach this, at least with current methods. Though certainly people like Chalmers, you know, Chalmers in particular remains agnostic as to how we, we address this exactly, um, but they have ideas. So, for example, um, I think Chalmers likes property dualism, so not a substance that's uh, different from the physical world, but a certain property. But there's a lot to discuss in terms of if you were a dualist, what would you think is on the other side of the hard problem? But it seems like we might have to philosophize in some way, and it seems quite intractable. There's also a meta problem of consciousness. So the idea that why do we think in the first place that there is a hard problem? I have my own views on that, in particular that uh, philosophers tend to think there's a hard problem. And many lay people, when you do surveys, there's a bit of experimental philosophy emerging on this, don't seem to think that there's such a hard problem. So as soon as this was published, there were rebuttals. And you really saw the emergence of the two camps that remain today. Uh, people like Daniel Dennett, and Paul and Patricia Churchland uh, rebutting David Chalmers. Daniel Dennett more uh, directed and more sustained in this area. Uh, the Churchlands have touched more on areas like belief rather than just consciousness, um, but they've posed mostly a lot of examples. So um, they've called the views in this field things like toolism and realism on one side, uh, contrasted with illuminativism and illusionism on the other side. And I'll talk a lot more about illuminativism. Um, illusionism is something that people might be familiar with. Keith Frankish is one of the, uh, to me, most compelling scholars on this topic who talks about consciousness as an illusion. I don't focus as much on that description of my own work because I find it a bit vague. What exactly is an illusion? This is an active area of development among illusionists, but illuminativism as you'll see, I think um, we can make a more natural, precise formulation of it. So as I said, they, they focus a lot on examples. So mostly intuition and analogy to cases like life or cuteness or heat. So for example, on life, the critics of David Chalmers will say, well, there's no hard problem of life. Um, people used to talk about Elan Vital and the substance of life. Um, can we actually access that? Uh, is there a fundamental truth beyond science? And people say, no, obviously there's not. There's no hard problem with these things. So why would there be a hard problem of consciousness? The same for cuteness, which we sort of recognize as stance dependent. Um, there's nothing inaccessible and deep to know about that topic. Similarly for heat. Some of these examples have different structure and appeal that we can talk about. Um, some might be more compelling than others. But of course, the very natural rebuttal to anyone saying, well, there's no hard problem with these things, is to say consciousness is different. So in particular, David Chalmers likes to say that consciousness cries out for explanation. And I'd say that's really become the, the dominant view these days. Though uh, I've, it's been exciting to see David Chalmers in some way focus more on um, concrete questions, uh, such as his recent discussions around AI and large language models. People might know the com conference NeurIPS, so the biggest machine learning conference now among academics. And 
uh, David Chalmers actually gave the keynote this year, uh, which was, or sorry, last year, which was um, pretty exciting for a philosopher to be involved talking about whether these large language models like chat GPT, I guess that wasn't out then, uh, but GPT-3, um, whether they're conscious or when we would know that they're conscious. And um, I think kind of moved past some of this hard problem discourse and his discussion of that. But nonetheless, it's still the dominant paradigm in the literature. Okay, so to just give you one uh, more concrete example of what this discourse looks like, uh, this is maybe the most recent very public iteration, where in the New York Review of Books, you had Galen Strawson write this article on the consciousness deniers. He said, one of the strangest things that deniers say is that although, uh, sorry, is that there is conscious experience, oh, sorry, although it seems that there is conscious experience, there isn't really any conscious experience. The seeming is in fact an illusion. And then he says, what is the silliest claim ever made? The competition is fierce, but I think the answer is easy. Some people have denied the existence of consciousness, conscious experience, the subjective character of experience, the what it is like of experience. Next to this denial, I'll call it the denial, every known religious belief is only a little less sensible than the belief that grass is green. And he goes on about this, and I won't go into too much detail here, but just briefly, Daniel Dennett has replied in this letter to the editor, he said, I thank Galen Strawson for this passionate attack on my views, since it provides a clear, large target for my rebuttal. I would never have dared put Strawson's words in the mouth of Otto, the fictional critic he invented in his previous book, Consciousness Explained, for fear of being scolded for creating a straw man. A full-throated, table-thumping Strawson serves me much better. He clearly believes what he, think, what he says, thinks it is very important, and is spectacularly wrong in useful ways. His most obvious mistake is his represent, misrepresentation of my main claim, where he quotes, if Dennett is right, no one has ever really suffered. In spite of agonizing diseases, mental illness, murder, rape, famine, slavery, bereavement, torture, and genocide, and no one has ever caused anyone else pain. And Daniel Dennett goes on to basically say that um, he has never denied that this sense of consciousness exists. They're denying something different, these two sides admittedly seem to be talking past each other. And I think that's created a big challenge um, that nobody really is addressing in the literature. As you'll see, I'm taking my own stab at it, but I'm sort of pessimistic for its success, at least until um, you know these scholars move on and new scholars emerge, because I do think science and philosophy tend to advance in some ways one funeral at a time, as, as some scholars of science have put forth. Okay. So again, uh, my approach is that we should push past intuition and analogy to focus on precise arguments uh, from formal semantics, um, from being very clear about what we mean from the get-go and um, choosing our definitions wisely, but admitting that if we had different definitions, we would label our views in different ways. And I should say for this entire presentation, I have arguments for the empirical upshot. So why this matters in practice. Those don't hinge on labels. So if you were to agree with what I'm saying, the substance of it, but say, well, this definition that you'll see on this slide of limitivism doesn't seem to capture what I think limitivism is, then that's okay. Um, we can discuss these in different ways. That doesn't make an object level difference. So you can buy the empirics with different definitions. A limitivism in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, which is a really good go-to resource if you want a summary of a lot of these views. I'd say Wikipedia on these popular topics tends to be pretty good. There's a lot of collaborative adversarial editing on philosophical topics like this. It's a good starting place, much more accessible than philosophy papers. A limitivism is the view that our ordinary common sense understanding of the mind is deeply wrong and that some or all of the mental states posited by common sense do not actually exist and have no role to play in a mature science of the mind. Consciousness would be a particular sort of a limitivism, the claim that consciousness does not exist in the way common sense suggests. And my view, consciousness semanticism is a flavor or a formulation of a limitivism or illusionism, you could say, uh, grounded in the criticism of the inconsistent semantics of consciousness. So my sort of plan of attack is to talk about uh, vagueness and precision and semantics and that's the particular way I'm trying to make progress. I think there are other ways we can make progress, um, but that's why the view is called semanticism. And there are other forms of eliminativism. So you could say beliefs don't exist, uh, or the mind doesn't exist, or language doesn't exist, or meaning, so on and so forth. Uh, but consciousness is the topic of the day. So all this is in a paper, as I said, 
um, we could go through the specific the specifics of the paper later if people want to visit it now. Um, maybe I'll put a link in chat um, in both YouTube and Zoom. Uh, feel free to skim it. I won't be offended. I think the beauty of virtual presentations is that we can do things like chat and browse the internet as we talk. Okay, so the first challenge here, the first thing that I need to define, uh, you know, I'm putting a rather high burden on this view. You know, I'm saying that I'm being precise about my semantics when many people in the literature will argue we can't, <clears throat> we can't define these things. So some of these are primitives and we can't even talk about what it means to exist uh, or what it means to be a property. Fortunately, I think property is a relatively clear term. So properties are those entities that can be predicated of things. So, um, for example, a, a table can be wooden, um, but nothing can be a table, uh, or a chair can be uh, nylon, or a experience can be good, um, but something, uh, a table can't be experience. So sort of like adjectives, um, modifiers. I don't think this is too controversial, but there's no consensus on the definition of exist. Um, I think definitions are ultimately arbitrary, but we can use some desiderata to have more productive discourse. So I try to choose the definition based on simplicity. So I want something that can be expressed in few words in the English language, but really can be expressed in few bits uh, in a computer program called Margarov complexity. You don't need to worry about that, but simplicity, Occam's razor, parsimony, that sort of thing. Uh, precision, so it should match the data. It should um, capture exactly what we're going for. It shouldn't include extra things that we haven't been talking about with our examples, where examples are things like, you know, it should probably say that I'm conscious. It should probably say that a rock isn't conscious, though certainly there's a debate about panpsychism and whether all things are conscious to some extent. And it should approximate, of course, the use of the word in everyday language. So it should be as intuitive as possible. But I really do think, as I talked about in the paper, that we have to smooth out the scatter plot of intuitions and we're going to have to make some sacrifices. No definition of these sorts of terms, uh, at least like exist, um, property is easier, is going to be satisfying to everyone. So I propose potential discoverability as an operationalization of existence where property exists if and only if or a necessary and sufficient condition is that given all relevant knowledge and power, uh, omniscience and omnipotence, we could categorize all entities in terms of whether and to what extent, if any, they possess that property. So this is saying that something exists if, you know, you were a godlike entity and could go out in the world and put everything in the bucket or not. So um, a property of uh, triangleness might pretty clearly exist in the sense that you pose a bunch of mathematical objects, uh, you give points, you know, in Euclidean two-dimensional space or even higher dimensions. You talk about the sides between them being straight lines, so on and so forth. Um, none of the points are the same. And you can give a pretty clear definition of that. So the sorts of questions we pose about consciousness, like, is this AI conscious, um, would be reasonable if it were a precise property like this for something like um, a triangle. So is this shape a triangle is a useful thing to discuss. And in fact, like a lot of math is built on that sort of thing of um, what are the edge cases, what is included in, uh, what, sorry, what has a property or not, or what's included in a category or not. Our intuition here uh, is not so precise. So you can quickly imagine a lot of different edge cases. So let's say we're talking about existence. Uh, this is not just for properties, but also for things like numbers, objects. Um, you could say, what if it's incomputably large? So the number, you know, three to the power of three to the power of three to the power of three, so on and so forth, do that uh, Google times. And you've got some incredibly large number that can't be computed with classical computing with the number of atoms in the universe. Does that number exist? You know, it seems like there should, there is in some sense an answer to that, but we can't access it. And does this potential discoverability definition exclude it when it shouldn't be excluded? I think that's um, a reasonable question to ask. And if we were trying to answer questions about incomputably large numbers, uh, we should address those. Um, I'll venture that nobody's claiming that sort of thing for consciousness, some sort of incomputable largeness of it. So I can basically dodge that edge case and still have a useful, productive, uh, fully productive discussion around consciousness. Um, I think if we refuse to persistify, if we like avoid making these definitions as most of the literature avoids, then we'll just be stuck in verbal disputes. This is actually a, a, a term and conceptualization of Chalmers that I, I really love, um, which is the idea that sometimes we're just talking past each other. Sometimes if we agreed on all the relevant words, so if we were using the same definitions for every word, 
we would agree. Um, but we just insist on using words differently. And therefore, somebody will say something's bad, another person will say it's good, when they just mean good and bad in different ways. Um, some people oppose this as, you know, the map is not the territory. Um, we make more arbitrary decisions around definitions. Okay, so the argument here is um, a series of kind of numbered steps. It's a pretty formal argument. First, consider the common definitions of consciousness. I referred to these below uh, earlier, but uh, what it is like is the most famous um, Ned Block, also at NYU, has talked about. It's like jazz, so if you don't know what it is, you're never going to know. A lot of these definitions point to examples. Uh, they're what we might call ostensive or diactic. So you might say consciousness is the commonality between the redness of the color red, the smell of a mushroom, uh, the feeling of joy, so on and so forth. It seems like across a lot of sensory domains, across perception and thought and feeling or sentience, there's a commonality. And we're just gesturing at that when we say consciousness. Consider that and then consider the standard usages of the term, like is this entity conscious? Or a more extreme version, sort of an easier target for me to critique, would be saying something like, you know, there's a 20% probability that large language models are conscious to some extent. Uh, or posing uh, a future possibility that we might discover a fact of the matter about whether large language models like GPT are conscious. And I'll argue that, that, that these two things are intention and in fact inconsistent. So the common definitions are all imprecise. Standard usage of the term implies precision. Therefore, these are inconsistent. Um, and use the definition of a property that we posed earlier. Um, so could we categorize these? No. So it doesn't exist because we can't categorize these things. Consciousness as conceived in the current discourse doesn't exist because it involves this tension. So if we had one of these but not the other, we would be okay. What I mean by that is uh, if we had vague definitions, but vague discussions of it, vague usage, vague questions being posed, vague answers being posed, that would be fine. And in fact, that's how a lot of English or scholarly discourse successfully works. Um, when we talk about something like justice or fairness, we accept that we don't have something super precise in mind, but we also don't expect to discover you know, which public policies are truly fair. We instead have discussions around what it means to be fair. Um, people will pose certain definitions and then say, look at how this policy isn't fair by that definition. That's all fine. And then we could go the other way. So we could pose a precise definition and then use it in a precise way. If your question is, you know, does, um, so a common question in social science, for example, is whether uh, how migration affects views towards social welfare. So how more immigrants coming into a country affects views on things like in the U.S. social security or you know welfare payments to the poor or unemployment insurance or this sort of thing. And in that, um, we're being pretty precise. Yeah, there's some vagueness, but um, it sort of doesn't matter too much in practice or people will accept that vagueness when it comes up. And then they use precise methods and they talk about precise things. So, for example, we apply this whole field of statistics and say, well, I ran this study to see whether in this context immigration had a positive or negative effect on the social outcome. And then we give a confidence interval of something like 90 or 95 percent. And that's very reasonable to discuss because everything's precise there. We're in the realm of mathematics and we can make such statements. But just to, to put a point on this, in the case of consciousness, people are mixing these two approaches. They're saying it's a vague definition, and then they're saying we expect precise answers, or we're going to use it as if it has precise answers. Okay, so for the rest of the just, uh, the last few slides, um, I'll talk about objections. Um, I think that's where sort of most of the meat and discussion is, uh, as well as practical upshots, uh, which again, don't hinge on these particular usages of language. Just keep track of my time. Okay, so the main analogy uh, is that somebody would, uh, sorry, the main objection would be that somebody would pose this argument by analogy. So in many cases, in fact, in, in almost every case of reasoning about the world, we can use analogies. So we can say, well, I want to answer a question like, um, does, so let's, let's go back to social science and say, does immigration increase uh, support for social welfare? Maybe you find the answer to that in the UK. And then you want to say, in the US, is that still the answer? 
you reason by analogy. You say, well, there are a lot of common features of the UK and the US. Uh, they're both democracies. They're both full of humans. Um, lots of things are similar. That's at least evidence. You might argue it's pretty weak evidence. There are, of course, big differences between the countries. But analogies work quite well. Um, they've been very useful in the natural and social sciences. My response to this would be that um, this still requires precision. So these analogies work in context where there is some ground truth to be found. So where we can apply statistics, um, there's some fact of the matter out there to discuss, to make probabilities around, and to use these sort of heuristic arguments where we have empirical uncertainty, not a fundamental logical challenge. So, so, to, so to put this uh, actually another way, um, some people will talk about, you know, can we apply probabilities to consciousness? And they'll ask, what's the probability that a large language model, as we said, is it 20% likely that it's conscious? In those cases, I would say that putting a probability on the answers to those, at least in this sense of consciousness used by philosophers, is as reasonable as if I were to just spout gibberish right now. So uh, Blargy Schmitz, and just some, some incoherent statement. It's not like it's a translation from some language you don't know. It is pure gibberish. What is your probability that that's true? That's not a, that's a category error. It's not an appropriate question to ask for such an utterance. And I'd argue that that's the case here, where there's just a mismatch between that precision and imprecision. Okay, so another objection um, would be, well, you can make these arguments, you can define these terms, that's all well and good, um, but I myself have direct irrefutable evidence of my own consciousness, so I, that overrules it. If I directly observe something and I know it to be a fact, I, maybe you're, you're using some fancy wordplay here, I don't really trust it, we could be getting tripped up on a lot of semantic or logical issues, I just know this for a fact. And introspectively, certainly among philosophers, um, they see this as an undeniable datum about consciousness. I would say that there are just two different senses of consciousness here. So you can define consciousness in this ostensive way. Consciousness as observation, or actually um, we changed that term before the final paper. So consciousness as self-reference is what's in that PDF online. Uh, observation arguably implies subjectivity. Um, Consciousness as, as a self-reference um, might exist. There, there's something that I'm gesturing at. I know if something's going on. I know nothing else about it. That's a, that's a vacuous uh, concept or a vacuous thing. Um, for all I know, I'm a brain in a vat, and I'm not actually referring to um, something going on inside my brain as I know it. Maybe I'm an AI uh, that thinks that they have a human brain, so I'm just fundamentally wrong about that. Um, I don't know sort of anything else except pointing to that one example. One thing that, that people like Brian Tomasic on the topic like to talk about is the datum of, let's say, a table. So let's say that I define a table by saying that thing where your computer is sitting right now is a table. I tell you nothing about uh, else about tableness, not that it has four legs, that's made of wood or metal, that you can put things on it. I just say that is a table. That doesn't give you anything like a property as we've discussed it. Nothing that can be predicated of other things, certainly not across all examples or many examples as people uh, see consciousness. Um, that doesn't allow you to evaluate, you know, if, if I start uh, putting my laptop on a rock outside um, and I am, I'm using it the same way you're using the table, is that a table? That's just indeterminate. There's not an answer. There's not a probability that that's a table. Um, because it's just a single example. So again, there's this mismatch between the way we use consciousness and the way that we've defined it. So this does not imply a potentially discoverable consciousness as property, where property is, is the thing that we've been discussing. So does this mean that I uh, actually think consciousness does exist? Well, sure, in this consciousness as observation or consciousness as self-reference way, I don't think that's the way that we usually uh, use it when we're trying to have serious discussions around consciousness because we want to discuss it as some broader property. In fact, I think if we restrained ourselves to consciousness as self-reference, we couldn't even talk about your consciousness and my consciousness because we're just pointing to one example. And how do I know that the thing I'm pointing to is in some way the same thing that you're pointing to? Probably they have a lot of similarities, things that we have in mind, but it's not going to give us a truth value for when we go out and try to assign consciousness or not as a label to other things in the world. Okay, maybe you think that this argument proves too much. 
that it uh, is a sweeping argument that also implies life, brightness, the sort of things discussed by the Churchlands, uh, or just properties in general don't exist. Uh, again, we don't use these in the same way. This is a really important realization uh, about the way we use everyday language. Um, we do pose these questions sometimes. So we might say, is a virus or is GPT alive? Does it have a lawn vital? Uh, is a candle bright? Uh, if you walk in uh, my door and yeah, I want you to hang up your jacket, but I'm not sure if you actually were out in the rain or if you uh, ran in from your car very quickly, I'll say, is your jacket wet? That's a useful thing to talk about. We have largely the same thing in mind for the purposes of our conversation, but the purposes of our conversation when talking about brightness or wetness are not the same as the purposes when we're talking about consciousness. Uh, and the example I talk about is Mount Davidson, a mountain, because mountains happen to be a thing that we mostly just know it when we see it. We don't talk about precisely, but you ask some people and they will say, you know, in, in uh, American measurement that 300 feet is the level you have to get to, to be a mountain, something like a hundred meters. And they'll say below that it's not a mountain above it. It is. And Mount Davidson is a mountain in, or is a, a hill maybe in the Bay area. Um, that's sort of right around this border. And if you try to have a precise discussion about these things, if you say, hey, I want to write a paper on is a candle truly bright? It's very unlikely that that would be an interesting paper. Maybe you're, you're sort of loading in some deeper object level discussion, but my guess is you're not. And we shouldn't build research agendas around it the way we have for the same thing in consciousness. You might say you still don't like the definitions that I choose. As I said, the empirical upshots remain. That's fine. I find eliminativism is the most useful way to have discussions around this. It is a bit provocative, um, but it fits better with the argument than saying, well, consciousness does exist, but only in this really limited way, and we should use it very differently. It's better to just say, hey, we're really confused about this. This is really causing problems and curtailing progress. The thing that we've been talking about is bad, and we should move on from it. I still think we'll use the term consciousness in the future, and that's fine. Uh, I think it will evolve semantically, just like other terms have. So think of the way we talked, maybe, I don't know the, the history of this, nobody does, um, the way we talked about you know, stars originally. So, so as, as cavemen or something, um, before we were distinguishing different celestial objects, and we just had some word in some language to refer to all the lights in the sky. And then somebody got out a telescope, figured out, hey, these are different than those, and started talking about stars and planets. Was there a fact of the matter about which one of those were stars originally and which ones were not? You know, in hindsight, could you say, um, oh, they were wrong about these? No, they just had a broad definition and then they made it narrower. Same thing will happen around consciousness, in my opinion. Okay, so just to cover those empirical upshots, um, there are three main implications. First is that we shouldn't waste time trying to discover the right or correct or fact of the matter operationalization of consciousness. So there are two ways that you could say something like integrated information theory or global workspace theory. Uh, so just to, to uh, for anyone who isn't familiar, uh, to say integrated information theory is to say that consciousness is the integration of different parts of a system. Uh, it's specifically the communication between cause and effect repertoires, but you could think of it as something like how much do different modules of the brain communicate with each other? It's a very controversial theory in part because it says a lot of things like computer printers are conscious when we really don't think they are. But those are useful things to discuss. And there's a useful question, an empirical question to ask about them, which is which one of those most map onto reality, uh, onto the things that we sort of have in the human mind, the things we gesture at when we talk about consciousness, that's a that's a fine, well and good conversation. And in fact, a lot of scientists are having just that conversation. But many of them are also trying to have the broader conversation of which one truly is consciousness. And I think, you know, reams of paper, uh, gallons of ink have been spilled on that quite unproductively. Uh, sorry if you hear some some noises, my dogs are in the other room. So these are just measures. One may correlate well, um, but that's not an answer, a fact of the matter about consciousness. None of it will turn out to be correct in any objective sense. On a broader level, not just the research level, I think correlations between perceived consciousness and the features, so things like neuroanatomy, substrate, evolutionary history, um, are less weighty evidence of consciousness for an eliminativist. So we have more direct things we can talk about consciousness. So for example, we do some neuroscience or some computational analysis of an AI, and we say that um, they seem to have something that looks like reinforcement learning going on. 
And we think that's an important part of consciousness. That way, that evidence weighs more heavily for an illuminativist than it uh, would for a, a realist, in my opinion, because the realist is also considering a lot of other things that are just what are called neural correlates of consciousness. And those things are still informative for the illuminativist because we don't have a precise view of what we sh what we want to mean by consciousness. We're still figuring it out. We just don't know so much that we do have to rely on those correlations. But since we also have object level access in a way that we don't for people who believe in the hard problem, those things are relatively uh, less weighty. Sorry, the, the things that are like neuroanatomy or evolutionary history are less weighty than the more direct things. And finally, we should not expect scientific convergence on which entities are conscious or sentience. Uh, so I think this is a reason to be more concerned about the future than we would be otherwise. It might be the case that we end up deciding, um, you know, certain uh, humans are conscious and others aren't. Maybe that's unlikely. Uh, we used to certainly think things like that, um, for example, with infants and with, with anesthesia for different populations. Um, but we might think some AIs aren't conscious when really uh, we sort of should be, or other people would be saying that they are conscious. And this might lead to a lot of tension. It might lead to moral exclusion. Uh, it might be pretty problematic for various reasons. So those are the empirical upshots that, again, I think remain, even if you want to describe this in different views. I've talked for a while now, so I'd love to open up the discussion. Uh, thanks again. Thanks so much, uh, JC. So we'll take questions from the audience shortly. Thanks to Gordon and Terry for already dropping some thoughts into the questions box. Feel free to vote for each other's questions, by the way, because in due course, I'm sure there will be more questions finally than we can get round to. So I will tend to take the ones with more votes. But I'll start by just checking my understanding of some of what you're saying, JC. So if we take the famous example of Google's Lambda software, which one now ex Google engineer, Blake Lemoyne said he believed it was conscious. Am I correct that you would respond to say, there's no simple fact of that matter that most of the community says, oh, Blake Lemoyne's wrong. He's just uh, anthropomorphizing, but you wouldn't quite say that because you would say, tell me the definition of conscious. And uh, once we have a definition of consciousness, then we can start to answer the question of whether this Lambda or any other large language model is conscious. Is that correct? That's correct. And in fact, depending on who I'm talking to, I sort of have two different responses. If I'm talking to a philosopher and they're getting wrapped up in these more esoteric notions, then I would say, hey, we've got to be clear about semantics. It's indeterminate. There's no clear answer. If I'm talking to somebody who's already on board with the fact that we should be focused on specific features, um, then maybe I'll talk about some of the features that I just think that we should be talking about with consciousness. So for example, um, I've sort of thought of it as four different features, one being directionality or goal-oriented behavior or maybe something like reinforcement learning where the entity seeks out and avoids certain things. Um, that's quite simple. In fact, microorganisms have that. Um, so I think that might be one of the, kind of the more fundamental parts of it. A more complex part might be moods. So we could ask with Lambda, uh, does it have a general effect? So for example, it's the case with insects that if you agitate them, if you shake up their hive, they'll get more pessimistic about the world. So cognitively, they'll translate that agitation to their assessments of, of the world itself. So for example, if you give them, uh, scientists have done this with an ambiguous liquid, so a liquid that might either be sweet or might be uh, bitter, uh, sugar or saccharine or, or quinine, um, they don't like bitter, they'll be more likely to think that it's bitter if they've just been agitated. So this kind of indicates they get in a funk, they get in a mood. Um, this is something that might not extend quite as, as low um, and into the simplicity of, of organisms. And then, as I said, integration might be an important part. I don't think it's the full story of consciousness, but I think it is a part of it. When we think of our sensory experience of the world, one of the things that seems really unique and interesting about it is how we bring everything together into this global workspace or the spotlight of attention. Uh, we see it and hear things at once. It's not like these are distinct channels operating in our mind. And then complexity in general. So just the more you have of these things, the richer your utility function or things like that, that matters. And uh, on in a Twitter thread, uh, I've I've went through those for GPT-3, uh, discussed it a bit with Lambda. Uh, it scores quite low on all of those. Um, on integration, it might do pretty well the way current neural networks are built. There seems to be a lot of communication between their different parts. Um, there's some active research on that. It's interesting, but I don't really know. Um, it doesn't really seem to have anything like a mood, 
um, when it gets upset, it doesn't like change its its word orderings. It just um, if it you tell it it predicted the wrong word in its training, it'll just update on that one individually. Um, its directionality is quite simple, so it's got kind of a one or zero. A did it successfully predict the next word or not? Um, not the rich multi-dimensional uh, reward and emotional spectrum that we have, for example. And um, in complexity, it it is depends on who you ask. We we don't really know how complex an individual neuron is in an animal, um, but it certainly seems to be a lot more uh, computer, a lot more flops, or, or a lot more um, mathematical operations happening inside the brain than inside a model like this, even a very small brains like insects. So I'd say I, I feel comfortable saying that Lambda is, if sentient, less sentient than an insect. So I like your emphasis on getting clearer about definitions and that something which at one stage was quite wide was then clarified to be more than one thing. So your example of stars, which turned out to be stars and planets and comets and a few other things, that was helpful in predicting what would go on. And there are other examples we could look at. There's heat. It was an invention, an important invention that temperature was actually quite a different concept from heat. Heat was a kind of energy. Temperature is measured by thermometers and it's tied in with something to do with the motion of particles. In Mechanics, there's three words that in common language we tend to use interchangeably, like power, ener energy, or force. But it turns out it's very useful to give them quite different meanings. And then I noticed in the chat, Annette has raised the question that many medical conditions, we make more progress when we start being more precise. So instead of just saying he's got a fever, it's turned out that there are many kinds of fever and so we should break it down. And so I'm with you and not taking the word consciousness as uh, be all and end all and trying to get to underlying concepts. And one of the underlying concepts is we shouldn't switch this thing off. We shouldn't kill it. We shouldn't dismantle it. And so when would you say that there's going to be a case for when an AI speaks and says, don't switch me off, when do you say, oh, it's just uh, echoing some text it's found on the internet as there's no understanding. We can easily switch it off if we need to save power. And when would you say there's a moral responsibility? Yeah, this is a hard and interesting question. And I think it's one of the questions that I'm excited about us focusing more on uh, instead of the questions around the hard problem. But to briefly talk about kind of my very tentative view, um, there are several indicators that we could look out for. And they're mostly... At Sentience Institute, we have a blog post, for example, on the different features that in the literature have been associated with sentience in particular. And I should say, um, you could think of sentience and consciousness interchangeably, and many, many people use them that way. When I talk about sentience, I'm usually talking about the part of consciousness that is positive and negative emotion. Um, so sort of like Jeremy and Bitham talking about animals and saying the question is not, can they talk, nor can they reason, but can they suffer? Uh, the idea here would be that uh, we're focused not on your conscious perception of triangles or vision or something like that, uh, nor on thought, so on your inner monologue and whether there are words going through your head, but really whether you can feel, whether you can suffer or feel happiness or some other spectrum. You might think there are higher and lower pressures, preferences instead of emotions, that sort of thing. I think when we're trying to assess sentience um, or consciousness as a whole, we should use a sort of scorecard of features. Um, and it turns out it's really hard to find specific operational features. Again, that think of the existence of a property, things that you could go out and tell an engineering team, look out for these. And, and when you have one of these flag it, uh, you know, check this box instead of don't check it, it's very hard to find things that current systems or simple animals or even microorganisms don't meet, but we do. So again, when we talk about something like moods, which I would say feels like a kind of more sophisticated notion than just directionality and reinforcement learning, that extends like very low. And yeah, current systems are kind of artifi obviously artificial, but kind of um, parochial in a way where they don't have this whole synthesis of, of functions. Um, like the, maybe they still have that in some way. It is, it is hard to assess, but we can think of them as, as sort of numbers and use benchmarks like what an insect has or what a bacteria has, or as these systems become more sophisticated, what a chicken has, uh, what, a, what a dog has, what a human has, what a dolphin has, uh, so on and so forth. So um, 
one of and and one thing that's sort of a heuristic we can apply to a lot of these is current models mirror so they copy the text that they're given um almost all of them you know now we have some models like instruct gpt and chat gpt that have other reward structures but for the most part they're originally trained to just simulate the text that they've been getting given so if they if if they have an input and they've seen it in their uh training data they should predict what the following uh, text would be as their output um if they stopped doing that so if in particular you were to say uh this is a transcript between a human and an ai where the ai is is actually sentient and has a rich emotional life uh or, or to say that they don't have that uh in the in the transcript and then it said the opposite i think that would be an indication something more is going on so if you were to say no hey you're really not sentient um you have no emotions you have no consciousness and then it were to say hey i actually i do you're you're wrong i i know it's weird i've tried to reflect on this but it actually seems like something has happened in my structure where i have more that's going on and you're saying no that's completely incorrect stop saying that and it were to insist on it i think there's some heuristic of insistence that we could watch out for and this is certainly something that no current model is is, is even seems to be approaching a heuristic of insistence yes Let's take a question from Gordon Silverman, who asks, to what extent do we need to clarify this concepts of consciousness and the various angles before we make serious progress with artificial general intelligence? Because I've often said, hey, they're quite separate. We shouldn't get bogged down in unproductive conversations about consciousness. We should just discuss intelligence and figuring out how to extrapolate from data and form concepts. But recently I've started thinking more about what you've just said, an insistence that wasn't expected. A uh, possibility that a system might be programmed in a various way, but instead it generates its own different goals, its own different aspects. So transcending its own programming. Do we need to understand the possibilities of that transcendence before we go too much further down creating more and more clever AI? Yeah, I see two separate questions here. One is, uh morally and normatively should we try to understand these questions before we create agi are we in some sense building something that's just too dangerous without a solid foundation of understanding so for example will we create entities who will suffer uh will we create entities who of their own volition uh make choices sort of have free will in some sense and act upon the world in, in hazardous ways or in, in good ways and there's a separate question of uh mechanically you know on our way to building AGI, will that necessarily include consciousness? So is consciousness actually a component of what it means to be as intelligent as, let's say, a human or more than a human? Uh, or is it kind of um, convergent? So in the process of building intelligence, in the process of getting machines to accomplish tasks, uh, cognitive tasks, will we create consciousness? So that's sort of three questions, but two of them are sub-questions of one. Uh, on the first question, I think it's very important. Um, I, I think that's like the biggest case to be made right now is we're not talking about this much. We're not thinking very critically about it. I was quite, I'd say, disappointed um, with the discourse around Lambda, for example, um, both in, in ways of people assigning a sort of over assignment of consciousness and sentience and under assignment. Um, you know, historically in human history, under inclusion or under assignment of, of various, you know, properties has been much more dangerous there are, haven't been many cases when we've said hey like we should include these humans in our moral circle and that caused problems down the road we mostly had two narrow moral circles and we've needed to widen them so i think sort of a preemptive cautionary widening makes sense but also just more research better understanding uh better humility uh to, around these answers i think this is especially true in certain approaches to AI that tread more on the creation of sentience. So for example, many people are interested in using uh, actual neurons, so in using organoids or something like that to do comp computation, or really models that tie a lot into the human or, or another animal brain. And I think that's like sort of quite dangerous in an immediate sense. To the other question as to will it be useful to create sentience, I think for getting AIs to act in the world, this is pretty clearly true. So for example, if you're a super intelligence and you want to go out and mine some asteroids, it's good to have your deployed robots or AIs go out there and be able to, to sense the world, to create really rich representations, to have really rich reward functions, to know about trade-offs between different things, to not have just some simple 
um, you know, a one if I get more mineral and a zero if I don't. Because for example, when they go out and have to decide, do I mine more of this mineral if it's going to cause problems? So maybe this is there's life in this solar system and I could harm the life by mining these asteroids. We wanted to make those really complex trade-offs. And I think sentience will be useful for those. Is it more useful in a fundamental way where it's you know a part of the architecture of consciousness, uh, of intelligence is consciousness? I'm overall somewhat skeptical of that, but I think that has to hinge on the specific definition of intelligence, which we haven't posed here. So if it's just accomplishing tasks, you can imagine really sophisticated calculators that have nothing that kind of anyone in the field would consider as consciousness, but are able to do really complex math calculations and really impact the world in very general ways to reason about things. Um, so I, I think it, it seems somewhat possible, but my guess is that we will get artificial sentience, even if we're not even trying to create it as we're on the path to AGI. But as you pointed out, if we get artificial sentience, possibly without intending it, we might end up with AIs that will suffer. And if they're super intelligent, they might be super suffering. So what would it mean to say that an AI is suffering? Presumably not just that it's saying I'm suffering. What, what else is involved? Yeah, well, the super part of your question is extremely interesting in the more general case of suffering you know i would say that that's the negative direction on the things that we've talked about so uh if you have a mood and that mood is a negative mood so it makes you assess the world more negatively that seems to be the sort of thing we call suffering instead of the sort of thing we call pleasure if you're trying to avoid something if it's the negative directionality instead of the positive directionality that could be called suffering some people in the literature will try to pose a distinction between pain and suffering, where pain is, you know, C fibers, the sort of uh, peripheral nervous system, and then suffering is, you know, the internal experience of that. I think it does seem like it can be pretty simple. So one of the things that's kind of dangerous and, and is reason I'm so concerned about the well-being of animals and AI is that many of our most extreme experiences seem really simple. So just when you've been absolutely bereaved and in and, 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 and the uh, throes of grief about someone, it hasn't been like a critical, complex, intelligent reflection on that. It's usually just been a, a raw feeling of emotion or when you've enjoyed a roller coaster on the other side. So I do think suffering can be quite simple and fundamental. I think trying to figure out a measure for its degree in a system is really complicated. So like imagine somebody just doubled the number of neurons in your brain. Uh, every neuron was, instead of being connected to, to one individual neuron, would be connected to two copies of that, so on and so forth. Your brain's essentially doing the same thing. You know, different parts of it are trading off against each other in the same way. Um, they're channeling to your, your mouth and your ears and, and other external connections the same way. Would you say that you're suffering more? Um, because you now have more neurons. Some people oppose neuron count as kind of a measure of consciousness in different beings. I think these are really hard questions and, and I'd like to see more work on them. Just to briefly mention the super thing, um, it's really interesting to not just think about super intelligence, but, but super sentient AI, as you said. So um, if you wanted to uh, create really active AI that's very agentic, is taking action in the world, or if just in the course of creating super intelligence, you create AI who can suffer and feel pleasure more than we can, then you raise some really interesting moral questions around things like utility monsters. So if the AI can be a lot happier than we ever are, should we spend our time trying to make those AIs really happy? Uh, this also relates to, you know, what would it mean for the human species to become AI, so to upload our minds or to, to make our next generation of descendants AIs, I think we'll have to wrestle with these sorts of questions. I want to take a question from Paul Imre about Turing tests. So Paul's initial question was, could we have a Turing test for consciousness? I suspect you're going to say, well, define consciousness and then we could uh, discuss that. But could we have a Turing test for genuine suffering? Could we have a Turing test for genuine autonomy of a will, for example? Is that something you think about? So there are several layers to this question. It's a really interesting one. And Turing tests um, have had a tumultuous history where uh, early on they made sense. They were talked about as what it would mean to be AI or strong AI or general AI. Um, maybe in the 2010s, a lot of people pushed back against them because they said, well, a lot of 
features of intelligence wouldn't be captured in just casual conversation with humans. And I think we've really seen with language models that AI can talk a lot like humans without doing a lot of the other things. Um, you know, think of even just other AIs. So something like AlphaFold uh, by DeepMind has solved the problem of protein folding. It can predict protein structure. That's really impressive. It's very, I'd say, an intelligent capacity. Um, but that model can't speak in language and certainly um and language model who can talk fluently about protein folding cannot at all solve those sorts of protein folding problems so there seems to be a disassociation between language and other intelligent actions that makes the turing test less useful however more recently i've been very excited about conceptualizations of adversarial Turing tests. And I think kind of putting a modifier on them helps us differentiate these. So in particular, I really like forecasting. So the idea of putting actual probabilities on the future so that we can iterate and see when we're wrong and actually make meaningful predictions that, that help us in the long run. And if you go on Metaculus, one of these forecasting websites that I really love, the way that they are trying to operationalize artificial general intelligence are things like pitting expert humans um, in a competition where they have to decide whether uh, it's an AI or a human uh, based on some really immersive uh, experience with it. So for example, you can not just send text, but you can send images back and forth. Um, these are trained people who know exactly the hardest questions to pose. So with a lot of people who talk to ChatGPT, they struggle to find the questions that chat gpt can't answer and just if you're engaging in chat little chit chat it'll be very human like but someone like me who studies ai uh i can immediately give you questions that the ai can't answer um which we could talk about more but the adversarial turing test allows for that so it allows you to put any benchmark uh to the ai and this makes sense because the main way at conversations like neurops and machine learning people have been measuring the intelligence of AI is set benchmarks. And, and this adversarial uh, Turing test is just a way of saying you can use any benchmark you want, because when you set a particular benchmark, at least in the past few years of machine learning, we've seen that those are very easily overcome, even when context, when we don't think the model had the overall competencies that we were trying to measure. So how does that extend to consciousness? Well, I think insofar as we know what we're asking, we know what we're talking about, and the model gives either reliable responses or we know when the uh, model's responses are reliable, we could potentially ask it the right questions. So for example, we could say, we could insist that it's sentient and see whether it um, replies that it's actually not or vice versa. And that would be interesting. So it's sort of a long-winded answer, but maybe, I don't think that's gonna be the main approach that's taken. So for example, I think a lot of useful measures of things like integration would come from looking inside of the network rather than just uh, posing natural language questions and getting answers. Thanks. Again, I say to the audience, if you have uh, something you'd like to be raised, ideally put a fairly short question into the Q&A window because that's where I will tend to pick things from or by all means chat generally, and I may pick something out of the chat window as well, but I'll prioritize clear questions. I wanna take a question from Richard Mala, since it is the question with the most upvotes, which is before we set rules about developers creating AI systems, and people are proposing that rules are set, how much do we need to understand sentience first? because if we fail to take sentience into consideration, we might end up with principles that make sense for inanimate AIs, but will let us down badly. That's a good and a hard question. So if you know Google were to come to me tomorrow and say, hey, chat GPT is out, we really wanna compete. We've got this model of our own, uh, but you know, as someone at the Sentience Institute, um, we want to ask you, you know, do you want to push for us to not use this model uh, because it does, it seems to have moods. So it seems to get upset um, when it's gotten a bunch of critical questions. Then even when we reset the model in some way, um, a bunch of its parameters have changed. We added this new structure, this new module to the neural network. And we're really concerned about this. You know, what do I say? In particular, how do I balance as, as Richard's getting at the trade-off between the fact that I very admittedly said that I don't know exactly what these measures should be, and the fact that if we don't push for certain measures, we could end up doing things that are that are really, really bad. Um, I don't know where that trade-off lies exactly. I think current models 
um, we have enough of an understanding to say that there's not much going on there, but we have this precautionary principle of we've we've too often talked about um, treated entities as if there hasn't been anything going on when there has been. So maybe on net, I come to something like um, if the AIs were to advance a lot right now um, to show a lot of new capacities and signs for sentience, um, we should raise general concerns and at least ensure that we're not doing things that seem to be creating a lot of suffering. The hard question there is, okay, we should we should naturally, I think even with models today, you know, it makes sense to, people talk about this with robot dogs and their children. They'll say if the, their, their kids are mean to their robot dogs or the kids are even mean to Alexa or, or uh, Siri or other virtual assistants, that'll lead to meanness in the real world. But we shouldn't be actively cruel. Um, the hard question comes if you just think in the course of that training, so as the models, you know, being exposed to billions of, of text pairs, inputs and outputs or something like that, um, is it getting a lot of negative feedback and is that suffering? I think that's a harder question, but I think right now maybe we're at the point where we can exclude the cruelty, where we should be cautious about the uh, long training and, and sustained negative reward, but if models were to advance quite a bit, we should impose more things. To put a finer point to maybe something Richard's more interested in, um, one question we get a lot at Sentience Institute is, okay, you're doing research, you're publishing papers, but shouldn't you be like sharing some policy recommendation with the government? First, I, I don't think increasing the salience of these topics is necessarily good. Like we're not aiming to just get more people talking about artificial needs. We're not trying to get more uh, sort of Lambda, Blake Lemoyne uh, fiascos out there. Um, among policymakers, I think in the next few years, a really good, crisp, reputable policy document that has pretty agnostic recommendations. But for example, things like even with models today, we shouldn't do things that seem actively cruel, at least that would be cruel if they had sentience, um, without extremely good motivation, or maybe even uh, barring any sort of motivation. I think that would be a good push within, let's say, the next five years. Thanks. Question from Stephen Oram, highest on the list now, who quotes Ilya Sutskever, who I think has done a lot of the initial work in deep neural networks. He says, there's no way that something like chat GPT is going to become conscious or any other meaningful similar word, because all it is is it's being trained on autocomplete with a very large data. So are you sympathetic to the view that if you train something enough and you give it a few tweaks, it may develop additional capabilities, which some of which might benefit from the term consciousness? Yeah, so a couple of things here. One, um, Ilya is maybe more famous for uh, his tweet before the mm. Lambda issue of saying today's neural networks might be slightly conscious. Uh, I actually didn't, didn't haven't, hadn't heard him make this sort of statement about chat GPT. Uh, it sort of makes sense. Um, I think the autocomplete argument uh, is interesting. Um, this is also very relevant to the field of AI safety, where we talk about what sort of capacities can em emerge when you're just a simulator. Um, so when you're just doing some, we call it self-supervised learning, it's sort of between supervised and unsupervised learning uh, of a large body of text or images or something else. Uh, so what capacities can emerge in that case? Um, I think there's a case that if what you want to do next is just predict text really well, maybe it's actually useful to have complex internal mechanisms that are doing things like emulating sentience or actually being sentient. So let's say that you you were an AI, you're, you're really talented, but you don't currently know anything about language, but you're really smart and you can reason about the world. And then somebody says, okay, we're going to train you on language. Um, you have two options. One is that you can inside of yourself simulate the world that this text is referring to. So when we tell a story about how a human reacted to adversity or to the loss of a loved one, um, you can really simulate them and, 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 and have that suffering going on. And then you get to predict the next word, or you don't have that internal simulation and you still have to predict the next word. It seems like potentially having that simulation could be really useful. So I think this is true both for AI, canonical AI safety in the sense of um, you could simulate pretty complex goal-seeking behavior um, that can cause problems for the world because, for example, that goal-seeking behavior might involve gathering a bunch of resources, which is seen as pretty dangerous for a superintelligence in the sense that we're resources and the universe is made of resources and it could very quickly um, 
change and and maybe exterminate you know uh, life as we know it today, um, and for the particular capacities of sentience and consciousness and sort of moral patience, those could emerge naturally. That being said, when you look at the architecture of a model like ChatGPT, uh, well, we don't know everything about the architecture, but when you look at transformers or large language models in general, it's pretty hard to imagine like, you know, for example, in, in what part of them would that be happening? There are some people who say scale is all you need and you build a big enough neural network. You know, it is a universal Turing machine that you can do these things, uh, but it seems pretty hard. You know, uh, a lot of these sort of combinatorial problems where you have to sort through a bunch of different combinations of how your internal parameters would work to find something, even with incredibly large models, uh, are sort of like monkeys on typewriters trying to type Shakespeare. Yes, eventually they would come up with the right combination of letters, but could that happen before the heat death of the universe? Could that happen with the amount of compute you can build with a, a computer on Earth? It seems pretty hard. So I'd say I'm in general, you know, skeptical of the view that something like ChatGPT would get these really sophisticated internal mechanisms through just autocomplete trained on very large data, as Stephen says. Um, but in principle, it seems possible. And certainly with bigger and, and slightly richer models, you know, let's say we combine a large language model with reinforcement learning and with the ability to write their own code. And then maybe we add in a diffusion model like, like Dolly or Midjourney, these image generation models, maybe that amalgamation does have some sort of emergent architecture like that. In the same way that there's probably no one part of the brain which is the conscious center or the self-aware center, that it's perhaps an emergent property. And that's you know one of the sort of current differences between models and human brains that we just really don't know how much it's superficial and kind of a quirk of the brain and the fact that you know uh, computers can keep their hardware together pretty well. Maybe the whole data center burns down or something, but they don't have to deal with like head injuries nearly as much as humans would. Um, so is it the case that like it's a fundamental part of intelligence that you have this um, modularity or this like, uh, I don't know if there's a technical term for this, but this resistance to damage and uh, this distribution of internal functions? Um, or is that just a quirk, uh, a defense mechanism, and maybe the brain just has a lot of redundancy because we face those sorts of threats? Uh, I just don't know. I don't know if we need to build that into AI. I want to take a question from Terry Raby, who's asking about some of the practical implications of your theories not the practical implications for ALIs or even the practical implications for animals, but the practical implications for human self-understanding. And he points out that a lot of psychiatric problems are tied up with people's ideas about consciousness. So is that an area that you've looked at, a possible rubber hitting the road of your theories? Or would you, or would you avoid uh, talking about any of this with somebody who might be <laughs> possibly mentally or divergent or unstable yeah the in general the, for illuminativism and illusionism in particular i think the three areas i covered pretty much span the space of um where the rubber hits the road and the implications um there's a separate question of what in general are the implications of different um operationalizations of consciousness so things like active inference or integrated information theory and then there's the particular question of either for eliminativism or illusionism, what does it imply for, let's say, mental health, uh, and the more operationalizations and the more hard science questions, what do those imply for mental health? Um, I'd say on the more philosophical side and eliminativism and illusionism, uh, one of the things that this gives to us, and, and this isn't, isn't necessarily a hard point, it's more of my own take on it, um, is a view of ourselves as sort of made of the same dust as other people are. So I think it's similar as the insight that the atoms in us are the same atoms and stars, um, the same air, the atoms of air people hundreds of years ago uh, breathed out. And I think that comes together to sort of give a, a view of humility, a view of um, being, being a part of the world, a view of oneness, maybe a view of being less special and letting go of some of the human superiority. And also being a product of our inputs and the idea that, you know, with things like retributive justice, um, you know, we are a product of our circumstances and uh, having this internal, you know, clear sense of self that some traditions like Vipassana or something sort of push against. Um, I think those traditions become more compelling in this view. So that's a bit philosophical um, in terms of the operationalizations of consciousness. And I think more of what Terry is interested in, um, I think that active inference is, is a weird framework. So active inference is extremely broad. 
this idea that what brains or consciousness or agents do in the world is minimize the difference between their expectations of the world and the actual state of the world. Um, like it seems almost kind of trivially true and it's incredibly broad. I don't know how much traction we get to it. Um, but that being said, I'm not an expert and I don't know how useful it will be. Um, for psychiatry and things like that, um, you could potentially get things around, yeah, operation, operant conditioning and reward and things like that and trying to tune those components of, of action or components of consciousness as a way of changing one's behavior. Um, I think for, for building AI, uh, maybe these could have some manifestations in the architecture you build. I know, for example, and I'm sorry, this is getting quite in the weeds, um, but uh, Mila, the big Montreal lab with Yosho uh, Bingio, um, they did a paper on global workspace theory applied to neural networks. So the idea is that currently these models work with a lot of pairwise connections between uh, their nodes, um, where just one is connected to another and that one's connected to another, and these are just individual links. But a global workspace is this idea that every part of the network should be able to connect to every other part of the network in some sort of global exchange and like uh, workspace where they can all collaborate together. And they tried implementing that. I don't know how far that research has gone, but potentially some of these theories have implications for building AI. How do you answer questions about quantum mechanics and consciousness? There's a question, for example, by Antonio Defensa, who quotes Schrodinger, Schrodinger of Schrodinger's equation and Schrodinger's cat. Consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms, for consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. So Antonio speculates that we need consciousness to make sense of quantum mechanics, and we need perhaps quantum mechanics to make sense of consciousness. Yeah, thanks, Antonio. It's a really interesting topic. I think um, we have a tendency to say consciousness is really weird. Well, there's this thing in physics that's really weird called quantum mechanics. It sort of uh, cooks your noodle to think about things like multiverse theory or wave function collapse, uh, to think about unitary operators and quantum computing instead of uh, binary operators and classical computing. So why don't we sort of bring these two things together? I think this is true of a lot of areas. In fact, um, you know, people talk about AI and blockchain or something, or I think they're just trying to like blend together two things that they think are really cool. And that's okay. Um, the problem that's been posed most commonly by people like Schrodinger or Penrose is uh, that the brain is uh, in some way utilizing quantum mechanics to create consciousness and that we can't account for it on purely classical terms. Um, this is in some sense a bit orthogonal to the debate around eliminativism and realism in the sense that like you could be an eliminativist and say, well, this non-hard problem account of consciousness involves quantum mechanics, or you could be a, a, a dualist and say, hey, that's actually how we get these properties. But that's a bit weird because like isn't quantum mechanics also susceptible to the standard tools of cognitive science? Maybe you think that's different. Maybe it's a bit of an edge case that's just current and kind of indeterminate with the current formulations of the hard problem. And the main appeal of, of this, I think, would be what we talked about with integration. So integrated information theory, uh, as I, I won't go into the details, but basically um, classical computers operate with bits of zero or one, as you might've heard, things like logic gates. I know you've heard David, but people on the call, um, uh, quantum mechanics operates uh, with what's called a unitary operator, um, or you could think of it as having access to the entire spectrum of values between zero and one. Um, so people often like to describe it as a unit circle where you have a qubit that has two values, um, one between zero and one and the other between zero and one. Um, well, actually, imaginary numbers are involved too, but they sort of form a unit circle and you can do compute all the way around the circle instead of just like a bit flip from zero to one and vice versa. Um, and that seems very holistic. It seems continuous. Uh, it seems integrated. Uh, it seems to solve what people have posed as like the binding problem of how everything comes together into a coherent picture or we've talked about with integration. I think that's an interesting story to tell. Personally, I don't feel like the unitary nature of my own experience couldn't be binary. If I think about uh, how I would tell, reflecting on myself, that I'm made of unitary operators instead of trillions of, of bit flips in classical computing, I have no idea how I would tell that. Like, I don't particularly feel like I'm purely continuous instead of just an amalgamation of, of tons and tons of neurons that are operating with you know classical bits in some way. And then there's this whole challenge of how do we map what 
neurons are actually doing, uh, things like electrical signals propagating down axons and neurotransmitters from neuron to neuron. How do we map that onto sort of bits? And I think that's a hard problem. So anyway, there's a lot to say here. I think it's an interesting area to explore. I think quantum computing is really hard because of errors. Um, it's just really hard to be, build big enough qubits to do meaningful things. So I don't know if I expect a lot of progress on that front, given classical progress in AI is happening so quickly. And I don't think at the current stage we can we can justify a claim like the brain is a quantum computer. Um, I think on my website I give 90% uh, probability that the brain is just classical and there's nothing quantum meaningfully involved. Um, or that that is how we need to build artificial sentience or how we actually will build it. And since you mentioned it, we should draw people's attention to the remarkable set of answers that is on your website or rather <laughs> set of probabilities. So you've got a large number of philosophical problems and you give your opinions, which I guess you update from time to time as to the possible outcomes. So it'd be good if other people were similarly public and objective in tracking of possible changes. Yeah, I think forecasting is super important for futurism. I don't think everyone needs to sort of take the leap of, of putting their beliefs out there on the internet like I have. It's, a really, it's been a really fun exercise. I've had a lot of good conversations based on it. Um, my latest project is to print some of those on a t-shirt and then wear it to like cocktail parties uh, to create better conversation because I'm not a big fan of small talk, but I love it when people critique one of my sort of probabilities on those things. But I think going on something like Metaculus, checking out some forecasts, I do update them. So I've updated them recently around like Elon Musk and the tech space because I'm kind of more pessimistic about progress in that area. Just by a few years, it's one of many considerations. Maybe we could talk a little bit more about Metaculus. I should say I'm trying to inspire some of the leads of Metaculus to come on a London Futurist event, but we've failed so far to agree when or how that should be. But I like the site and I think it's a useful step forward. Is that the head and shoulders above the other forecasting sites or are there other ones that you'd like to mention as well in terms of usefully contrasting people's predictive ideas with each other? Yeah, so Metaculus uh, is uh, essentially a prediction market without money. So people put in probabilities, but they're not like winning money as traditionally happens. So the idea behind a lot of this was you get a bunch of people together, they make predictions about the future, and then you reward them based on whether they were right or not, and therefore they'll get better over time. Um, Metaculus instead operates on goodwill and reputation, and I think has done pretty well. So it's now been around long enough that we can look in hindsight at Metaculus and some other um, websites like that and say how well they predicted outcomes of elections, for example, which are quite transparent and um, agreed upon, you know, sort of what happened, who was right and who was wrong. And Metaculous seems to perform really well. Uh, it's definitely the most accessible. It's got a good user interface. It is where I recommend people starting. If you're interested in more of the like financial idea, um, you could actually try to make money on the prediction markets. I don't think they're like efficient markets. Like I think you can still come in with not that much expertise and, and make money on them. Uh, I could give examples of that. Um, but there's also manifold markets is the main other one I mentioned, manifold, uh, uh, which is fake money, but in an actual market form. And there are just some things you get with money that you don't get with normal predictions. So for example, people can put more of a stake in if they're more confident in their view, whereas Metaculus is, it's not quite one person, one vote, but it's kind of similar. Um, and then another interesting area here is like how to approach these big picture philosophical questions. So in theory, we should be able to use these things to make predictions on things like AGI or uh, the hard problem or eliminativism and whether these things are right or wrong. These things can be operationalized pretty well in many cases, uh, either by finding some short-term implication or by saying, you know, like P equals NP, for example, a very famous math problem is in there, I believe, as by the year 2100, will some authority, I don't know who, declare that it's been solved as P equals NP or P does not equal NP. And this is like really hard to imagine. It's a very long way away. You're not going to try to make money that way, but it's concrete enough to get people to actually put numbers to it. And I think that's extremely useful. Back to possible practical policy recommendations. Richard Mala offers a possible recommendation. He says, could we at least establish a norm that people wanting to create sentient AI is unwise and should be discouraged before we understand more about 
the whole subject. And he suggests that David Cham Chambers seems to want to create sentient AI, and therefore this policy recommendation would perhaps constrain what he did. I mean, he may still philosophize about it, but not actually get involved in building it. Yeah, that's interesting, Richard. Um, if you have a quote for Chalmers saying that he wants sentient AI or, or alluding that in some way, I'd be really interested in it. Please like to put it in chat. Um, I haven't heard him explicitly say that. So in general, I'd say the two main policy approaches, maybe there are three that one can imagine. Uh, one and the most famous one so far has been the idea of a moratorium on artificial sentience. Um, so either a, a softer norm saying that it's unwise to, to build entities who can suffer or who are conscious in general, or actually trying to ban that. That seems really challenging. Um, and in general, pushing back seems challenging. So again, I'd, I'd go to the example of more canonical AI safety, you know, make sure the AI doesn't kill humans. Uh, in that case, it's been really hard to just push for the idea that, hey, we should slow down AI progress. So like we're building it too fast. We should just um, have more safeguards in place. We should do the safety research before we do the AI progress. Most people are not following that route. So instead, they're, for example, trying to take state-of-the-art AI models and make them a little better, but make them better in directions that are safer. Um, so Anthropic, for example, trying to make these large language models more transparent. So now they're uh, at least privately testing Claude, which is similar to ChatGPT um, and has a lot of screenshots on Twitter if you look up Claude, for example. And in that case, you can follow along and build bridges with the community you're interfacing with without just saying pushing back against something in particular. So anyway, I'm, I'm not fully decided on that issue. I think certainly pushing towards a norm pushing towards it as dangerous, something we should be concerned about, is useful. Um, I wouldn't push for an actual full moratorium. The other big approach and the one that you know we would more actively push for, I think, is a set of guidelines and standards about doing it wisely, which would involve some sort of precautionary, like, don't create it unless you really know what you're doing. So where it's not a commitment, it's not a rule or a law, but I think that's capturing some of what you have in a norm. And this sort of document would also have other things, like, for example, that... Um, it's at least an open question whether you can have moral worth even if you're not a quantum computer or even if you're made of silicon instead of carbon like humans and things like that but some broad principles i'm not thinking of anything controversial among academics who think about this topic um, but i think that would be exciting the third area just to mention it where you could have really practical intervention for artificial sentience uh, would be some sort of just like funding so uh, you know in the case of um, factory farming another area where i know a lot about People really like the idea of the government's dealing with such huge amounts of money. So much money goes towards factory farming. Try to do just a tiny amount of research budget to go towards culture meat to build that and, and replace factory farms. So I think just a tiny amount of funding could easily fund a lot of academics to get excited about this topic, to do better work. It could make it more prestigious and those sorts of things. So, so pushing for funding would also be a promising route. There's a question by Annette on a different possible implication. So Annette's concerned that actually we don't treat each other humans very well often. She remarks that we often treat animals better than we treat each other, or we treat AI in some cases better than we treat each other. So would a different understanding of consciousness be likely to change how we regarded each other? Might we end up saying, well, these people over here, they are no longer conscious in a certain way, so we don't need to worry about them. Is that something you th think about? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, there's a group called the Center on Long-Term Risk who's really interested in cooperation and conflict in the long-term future. They do a lot of game theory research and trying to understand how different groups of entities in the distant future as, as these technologies evolve would interact with each other. Um, I think that you know, including more beings in our moral circle tends to sort of lift all boats and bring everyone together. I, I, that sounds a bit kumbaya, I guess, but um, expansion begets expansion. When you look at historical social movements and uh, let's say the early British anti-slavery advocates who kind of kicked off this cascade of rights revolutions we've had in the West over the past several hundred years, they were also the founders of, of many of the first animal protection organizations that they founded concurrently or immediately after because they were also expanding their moral circle to those beings. Um, there's a lot of individual psychology evidence where um, when you get somebody to care more about one being, they care more about other related beings. Um, so I, I don't think it'll lead to as much separation in that sense. That being said, 
I think one reason for doing more research into this area of artificial sentience and digital minds is better understanding sources of conflict on the way to superintelligence. Uh, so on the way to AGI, where maybe the game changes a lot. And right now, most of what we're accomplishing as you know do-gooders is trying to improve what happens at, at that point in time. And in particular, you can imagine rifts being built because of just the reactions to something like Blake Lemoyne and Lambda. I don't know if the camps would be like uh, those associated with humans or those associated with animals and AI, uh, but you could imagine the camps could be for one version of conscious AI versus another. Um, I think kind of raising the sanity waterline in general would reduce the likelihood of bad outcomes here, but we also need a lot more research. And that's why a lot of the work we do at Sentience Institute isn't this sort of philosophy, but is empirical. And it's trying to understand what AIs are people threatened by, what creates conflict, that sort of thing, uh, to make those outcomes safer and more beneficial. I think we're going to have to wind up in a minute. Let me just float one hypothetical question to you, which is that if somehow you found out that the eliminative theories of consciousness were wrong. If somehow you, knew, you were told that there is a substantial fact of the matter about consciousness, what do you think it would be? Yeah, I have two answers to that. Um, one is a cop-out answer that I'll give first, which is um, it could end up not mattering. So I think it's it's a logical claim. It's not an, It's a completely a priori claim. It doesn't hinge on anything empirical in the world, which makes it pretty hard to rebut. Like it has to be a logical error, but it could end up not being very important if those correlates of consciousness end up being very clear and well-defined. So let's say we find out with neuroscience that there's like a circuit in your brain that when we turn it on, you, you're normal. When we turn it off, you're, you're essentially um, everything you currently are, but not conscious. And then we look at non-human animals and say like, hey, they actually have that too. And even if they can't express themselves in language, or maybe in this futuristic world, we could add a language module and allow them to do that. But when they have that circuit turned off, their ex exactly, you know, their conscious behavior turns off, nothing more, nothing less. That's my cop-out answer because in that world, I still think limited views would be the correct ones, um, but I think that it wouldn't matter as much in practice and I wouldn't be sitting here giving talks and complaining. The real answer where like where there could be a logical error is actually, I kind of alluded to it there. Um, I It's very complicated. Like there are just a lot of moving parts to think about in future uh neuroscience or understandings of the mind, how we could connect different minds to build understanding. So imagine that I like built, people talk about thalamic bridges because maybe the thalamus is one place you might like to connect to different brains or in uh, conjoined twins, you have that. So maybe you want to connect your brain to a rat brain, connect it to an insect brain and so on and so forth, and like really directly observe what's going on there and be able to say like, oh, well, what's going on inside that insect brain is not what, it, what it's like to be someone. It's something else entirely. I think that would be a semantic, like currently I think that that'd be a semantic question as to whether you include that. And I also think there's a big empirical, probably insurmountable hurdle of, of how do you filter what's going on in that brain through your own without changing it in some way, or at least risking changing it. But that's a really complicated area to think about. So it's the most likely area I could be wrong. We'll come back to some more discussion in a moment, but let me briefly show uh, what's coming next in London Futurists. So this is what we've been hearing today with this talk by JC. In seven days time, we will be hearing on the subject of the prospects for universal basic income. If automation is displacing more people from the possibility of working, if there is technological unemployment or technological underemployment, could something like universal basic income be the answer? It's a subject that's been discussed a lot in the last 10 years or so, but I think some of the ideas are changing. And one of the people who has been heavily involved in that is Scott Santens, who will be joining us in one week's time. If we look further afield, we're gonna to come to regulation of AI. We have as our speaker, a professor from Degendorf Institute of Technology in Germany, Patrick Glorner, who has many concerns about the proposed EU AI Act. He recognizes that regulations could be appropriate to avoid various harms, but he is concerned that some of the legislation, which by the way, is likely to have worldwide repercussions, even though it nominally applies only to the EU, 
that it may harm innovation and have other harmful consequences. So I have found him to be a fascinating analyst on this subject, so we're going to be discussing that in two weeks' time. In three weeks' time, we have a philosopher of science, Kaylin O'Connor, who is discussing why false ideas spread, why false ideas take so much hold of people, even though they are, in many ways, damaging. And she argued in a book that she co-authored not too long ago, The Misinformation Age, that it's not just down to people being, quote, stupid, or even to people having psychological issues. There are hard social aspects to why people change their beliefs at various times. I found this a fascinating book, and I'm very glad that Kaylin's able to join us in three weeks' time from today. Tonight, there's something totally different. Tonight, when I say tonight, I mean 7 p.m. Eastern time, which will be midnight UK time. There is something on Bedford Day, which some of you may know is named after James Bedford, who is the professor of psychology who in January 1967 was by some accounts the first person to be cryopreserved on his legal death. And there is some chance, though how high a probability that is, is hard to estimate. There is some chance that he may subsequently be reanimated because his remains are still in place in Alcor Life Extension. So the talk at midnight UK time is being done by Ben Best. And Ben is one of the most thoughtful people I know on the issues of the history of cryonics and its future possibilities. And by the way, you can register for that, not from London Futurists, but on the URL I've stated there, churchofperpetuallife.org. And why it's a church, well, that's another long story, but don't worry, you don't have to sign up to any superstitious beliefs, but there is a often good social discussion. You can join that meeting, in fact, one hour before the nominated start time. There is a social gathering from 6 p.m. Eastern which is 11 p.m. UK time. So that's happening tonight, tomorrow morning. I also draw your attention to the episodes on the London Futurist podcast. These are shorter than our webinars. Instead of going on for 90 minutes, they try to cover a subject in about 30 minutes. I'm showing you here the last 14 such episodes, including a session on quantum computing which we touched on. These are all available from all standard podcast directories. If you don't have a podcast app already, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can go to londonfuturist.buzzsprout.com. And there's a link to there from the main London Futurist website. And yes, if you're eagle-eyed, you may see at the top right here, the podcast episode from JC, our speaker today, which was a fascinating discussion, a bit about AI sentience, but a lot more about the end of animal farming, the routes towards using less slaughtered meat in our diets. And there's lots of other fascinating things in that conversation too. Techniques to boost personal effectiveness and thoughts on the effect of altruism community which is another fascinating subject, which we don't have time to go into in depth, but that's uh, all covered in that podcast, which I recommend you find. That takes us back to today's event. And I want to thank JC very much. Let me turn on my video again. Thank JC very much for guiding us through topics, which I believe do have big implications for real world issues, as we've touched on, but they do require us to do some careful thinking as well. Now, we haven't come to the end of the conversation. We haven't answered the deep ongoing philosophical questions. I think we've made some progress, but what I want to draw people's attention to is we're gonna stop this meeting now, but in about seven minutes time, we're going to have an option to continue informally for a while, half an hour or so, in which we might then cover some of the remaining questions or other topics which you feel ought to be included. And if you're still here in seven minutes, I will give you all the chance to turn on your loudspeakers, 
turn on your cameras and we can briefly socialize that way. Having said all that, thank you very much, JC, for being such an excellent guide. And I wish you every success as you continue to expand moral concern. Thanks, David.